Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Wheatley. Um, along with Dr. Girada, I'm one of the co-coordinators of the Early College Honors Program and um, one of the folks who's done this the last um, two summers with the SCIR students. So I had the real privilege of working with uh, four students this summer. I taught them a little bit of chaos theory and then set them loose on their own to do some things with that. Shani Glassberg here with us. So let me turn it over to her, but Shani. You are here. All right. Uh. So hi, everyone. I'm Shani Glassberg. Uh, my partner, Ali Gu, unfortunately can't be here today, uh, but she thanks all the early college honors programs coordinators and everyone who supported this amazing pro project. I'm sorry. So as Dr. Whitley said, I'm going to talk about fractals and dynamics today. So first off, I'm going to define what is a fractal. So the person in the picture, as you see, this is Benoit B. Malibroid. He is very famous for defining the role of fractal to co of coining the word. He wrote a bunch of papers about self-similarity, which is a concept we will explore later in the 60s and 70s. And in 1975, he coined the word fractal, derived from the word fractus in Latin, which means fractured. Um, he defined a fractal as a figure for which the, top the fractal dimension is greater and exceeding the topological dimension. So what is a topological dimension? What is a fractal dimension? First off, I'm going to explore self-similarity. As you can see, this is the Sierpinski triangle. This is a very, a very famous shape among dynamics and chaos theory, and sorry, dynamics and fractal theories. If you look at the top part of the triangle, each of these triangles compose the larger image, as long as you scale it by a factor of three. This, uh, sorry, this triangle is exactly like this big triangle, and the top part of this triangle, well, as long as you scale it equals this picture. This is a great example that exhibits the, uh, the sorry, um, uh, that exhibits self-similarity, a shape that is composed by the same shape, but smaller. As long as you scale it by a certain factor, you yield the same, you yield the same figure. So after we explore why this self-similarity, let's explore topological dimensions. It's probably the dimension that you all are familiar with, 1D, 2D, 3D. So, there is a line, a shape you're all familiar with, a square and a cube. All three, you mo I hope you all are familiar with. On a line, there, is, there are two ways you can go. Move forward and move backward. On a square, there are two ways, length and width. On a cube, length, height, and width. Sorry, length, height, and width. Um, so because there's only, one way to, there's only one way to move backward and forward, there's only one way to move along the line, it has a, it has a topological dimension of one. A square has two ways to move on it. Topological dimension two, a cube, three. The topological dimension of three. So after we got that down, let's talk about the fractal dimension, which is the, which is the topic Ali and I focused on. So a fractal, a fractal dimension is a way to measure a dimension for shapes that don't really have a very certain topological dimension. Shapes that you aren't really familiar, you, you probably aren't familiar with as much as you're familiar with a, with, a, with a square or a line. If you look at the bottom here and bottom here, these are two shapes that probably seem a little bit like 1D, but 2D as well. How many ways you can, you can move along the Sierpinski triangle? There is no certain answer. Usually people will say one or two. If you ever that out, usually the answer that people did research on, usually the answer will come around 1.6. Remember that number, it will be very familiar later. So the fractal dimension is measured by scaling. We are gonna explore a very simple concept that is seen here. The dimension equals the log of k, k being the number of pieces that, uh, needed, uh, sorry, the number of self-similar pieces in a, in a figure over log s, the scaling factor, the number, in, in, Sorry, <laughs> the scaling factor. The number you need to magnify the the each self-similar piece to yield a wall figure again. So let's look at what a line, why a line is not a fractal. If you take a line, split it into two equal pieces, each piece equals the other, self-similar self -similar exhibition. But you see, each of them needs to be scaled by two. So if you put it down, d equals log of two over log of two equals one. One is the, same, is the same as the topological dimension of a line. So this is, not a, this is not a fractal. Let's go again to a square. A square, you can divide it to four equal pieces. Each piece needs to be magnified by two. Log of four over log of two equals two. The topological dimension equals all the fractal dimension. So this is, not, this is not a fractal. So what is a fractal? You're probably asking at this point now. 
So this is the call curve. Unfortunately, I believe we won't be able to show you the whole video right now because it will go, go out of the PDF. So I'm just gonna jump ahead and show you. The, um, the call curve is gonna, uh, sorry, I'll go back and I'll show you that like that. So this is a line, it has a square in it. Now the call curve is made by splitting each line and, and sorry, <laughs> taking a third of it and putting it like that and another third and putting it like that. Now, the more you do it, the more you see this, um, the, Koch, the, Koch, the Koch curve present, uh, showing, a, an, I'm so sorry, showing, um, looking more and more like a, like a snowflake. So if you take the Koch curve and we split it into four equal pieces, one, two, three, and four, each of them needs to be magnified by a factor of three to yield the whole Koch curve again. D, log of four, the four identical pieces over log of three, the factor you need to magnify each piece by to yield a world figure, it gets 1.26. It is not a world number, it's not a topological dimension, but the topological dimension of the Koch curve is one. 1.26 is greater than one, so this is a fractal. Now, if you look at the Sierpinski triangle, go back to it, um, we can look, we can make three identical triangles. Each of them needs to be magnified by two. This side equals half of this wall side log of three, three conjoint triangle, over log of two, magnified by a scale of two, 1.584, almost 1.6, which is the usual number that if you ever, if I would were to ask all of you, what is the topological dimension of this Rupinski triangle, the answer would usually average around 1.6, which is very close to the, to the sorry, to the fractal dimension of the, of the Rupinski triangle. This is, a, um, I'm sorry, the, the Sierpinski triangle also exhibits dynamic behavior, which is what Ellie and I were looking into, fractals that exhibit dynamic behavior. So a dynamic, dynamic is a concept in math um, that, usu that usually means something, the next, the next part of a series is derived from the previous one. The, the, uh, the Sierpinski triangle can be, um, can be made, you would see it in a video that is linked frontally in, the, in this presentation, but I can't open it. Um, you, there are three different points in the triangle. You choose a random point, anywhere you want in a triangle. Now you choose one of this and take the half of it. Now you choose a different point of the triangle. You put a point exactly halfway through. This, called, this is a game called the Chaos Game. Eventually, if you, wield it in, if you do it enough times, you're gonna yield the Sierpinski triangle. Um, this is a great example of dynamics. Each point, each next point in this triangle is derived from the previous one. This game works as long as it's um, as the chaos game is random, and you don't choose the same the same exact point each time. So now we're going to look at a Cantor set. The Cantor set is a really good example of dynamic. We're not going to look on how exactly it's driven, but just know it is a very famous dynamic concept. So because as uh, sorry, the Cantor set, as you can see, it's derived. You take the middle third of each piece and just delete it. It's gone. De delete this. Delete this and it keeps, keeps, keeps going. So this has the topological dimension of zero because you can't go from here to here. There, is no, there are no numbers in the set here. There's topological dimension of zero. But now, if you look at the, at the fractal dimension of it, we have log two, uh, two to the times, to the, sorry, log two to the n, n being the number of intervals at every stage, n over log of three to the n. The magnification factor, n is the stage. Stage zero, stage one, stage two, stage three, and so on. Overall, this is gonna equal 0 0.63 or nine, which is greater than zero. So the Cantor set is a fractal and is, and is exhibiting uh, dynamic behavior. Um, there is one more way you can, uh, you can, there's many ways that you can show a fractal dimension, but one, uh, one way that my party really liked is the box counting dimension, dimension. C is a constant, arbitrary constant for, um, uh, that we're not gonna look into right now how it's come, but just know it is, a st it is a constant. Log of n, n being the number of boxes touched, s being the scaling factor. So let's look at this visually. Constant is one, s is one, n is one. The this fractal dimension is one. Sorry, if the fractal dimension is not here, but we're gonna look at s, with x, s equals three, n equals seven. If you look back, n, s. The, top, the topology, the, sorry, the fractal dimension is gonna, look, is gonna equal 1.77. S is six, N is 20. The topological dimension is gonna, look, is gonna be smaller. Um, so 
to summarize, the fractal dimension is going to measure, again, the roughness of a shape. If you look back, if you look back at a Srebrinsky triangle, this is a very rough shape. You have no way to actually determine what the topological dimension of this shape is. So the fractal dimension, which was researched by a lot of mathematicians all over the, year, over the years, um, is trying to apply certain mathematic concepts to these shapes and try to, to set a certain dimension to them. If you look at the coast of England and the coast of the US, people measured the fractal dimensions of them and came to the conclusion that uh, the, fractal, the fractal dimension of the US coast is larger than the coast of, is larger than the fractal dimension for the coast of the UK, meaning the coast of the United States uh, is way rougher than the, than the coast of the, of the United Kingdom. So the fractal dimension could be used in many ways, in math, in geography, and in so many other, um, sorry, so many other fields, oh, so many other fields. So that's what we looked into, and uh, that's it. Does anyone have any questions?